Welcome to The Rock. We hope what you watch today inspires you. And we'd love to hear your questions and comments via Twitter at The Rock of York. You can also find us on Facebook or contact us through the website at www.rockofyork.co.uk. In the meantime, let's crack on. Good evening again, everybody. Um, I'm quite excited about next week. Claire's one of my very good friends, and she's lived in that house for about a year, and I've still not seen her house, so I think that's a good excuse to go. So please, if you don't know anybody um, of those people, please, everyone is welcome. So just shout, and we will point you in the right direction. Okay. Um, I was really glad that we sang that song tonight about feeling safe, safe in his love, because I've been thinking a lot about um, feeling safe, feeling unsafe, and the different ways that sometimes I, and I'm sure you, react when we come to a belief that we may not be safe, particularly when we feel like we're not safe in the hands of each other. And I want to just share a little bit tonight. Um, I, I have that inevitable moment of insecurity you get whenever you come up here and you start thinking of all the things that y you don't feel equipped to do. And I'm not a preacher, I'm not a theologian, I don't know lots of Bible history or things like that, but I am willing to share what I've learnt, I'm willing to be who I am, and I hope that in sharing that with you tonight, um, you find it really helpful, because that I have come to believe is all that is being asked of us, to be loved, to feel safe and secure in that love, to develop a community where we can trust and feel safe with one another, and out of that, to express from our hearts where we are to encourage and build one another. That to me just sounds like heaven on earth, actually. So as many of you know, um, who have been part of this place for a while, we very much uh, went through a period of deconstructing some of what we might have thought in the past and looking at it in, with fresh eyes, with different eyes. Um, and that's been very critical for our journey to this point, but we are now in a process of very much constructing for a time. And I say for a time because nobody knows what's next, do they? This walk of faith is one that you can't see all the pieces, because if you could see all the pieces, it wouldn't be a walk of faith, because you could see it. And um, some of you who know the Bible very well will remember that Abraham was called to go to a land that he would be shown. He, didn't, he wasn't told, well, go 100 kilometers that way and turn left, and then you'll be there, and you'll stay there for six months, and after that you'll go. He had to, he had to really trust. Um, and I keep, kept thinking about that word, seed change. I know there's an expression, sea change, S-E-A, but I'm thinking of a seed change, S-E-E-D, where when you somehow decide to plant a new crop in a field, because you've dug up the old crop and you're planting something new, you don't wake up the following morning and expect to see a full um, display of what you've planted overnight. We all accept that that's going to take time, but we've put it in the ground, we've worked the ground, and, we know, and I know there's been a seed change. I actually think we're beginning to see shoots and growth above, above the line, um, but we are in that, and it's exciting. And I love what I learn here. I love how it helps me grow. Now, along with that, I've very much felt like I've transitioned to somewhere new. I don't know when I got there, but I, I have, which is encouraging. And I feel actually really totally different. And I like... I like what I've come to, but I find that sometimes I, I don't know then how to make things work that used to work when I was in that old field. Because when I was in the old field, um, I knew what to do with what I believed and where I was at. And then as you come to understand new things, you find that some of the things that you're walking out just don't, they just can't wear them anymore. It's like they don't fit. So we're all learning that. Um, and sometimes I want to go and visit the things that I had before because they made me feel safer, because they were familiar and they felt comfortable. And whenever I try and do that, I find it doesn't give me the same comfort because you're different. And that's not a problem, it's not a negative, but it's a little bit like visiting a grave. What was there died, you got a resurrection to something new and a new reality. So going back there... Um, doesn't quite work. And again, we've been learning in this place, forget the former things, do not dwell on the past. We're doing a new thing. And I wanted to encourage some of you again with that to say, um, we may miss sometimes the things that we had that worked for us at the time, but going back there 
won't feel um, the same as it did when we were there the first time because it was where we were on our journey towards somewhere else. Now, I used to be very um, ob obsessed or passionate, whatever you want to call it, about um, knowing um, God and understanding exactly how it all worked. Um, and I needed that because if I understood how it all worked and I understood everything about it, I could feel safe. So it was a control thing. It was like, if I, if I get it, I can feel safe. I can uh, make sure I do the right things. I can make sure I feel the right things. I can make sure I say the right things. And so I used to strive all the time for this relational feeling with God so that I would know I was okay. Um, and it used to help. I used to feel better in that because that was my solution at the time. Um, and I still wrestle at times sometimes with wanting that sort of feeling that I had at that time. Um, but I have to say that I've now come to uh, really, really to a place where I try my absolute utmost in life never to measure my spirituality um, or my standing with God on my feelings. Because I've found that my feelings can prove incredibly unreliable because the mind will justify what the heart has chosen. And so if it's always going to be based on a feeling, I've discovered in life when you, you look back through different eyes that sometimes, oh, I had a feeling. But it was amazing how often the feeling that I had um, was the, f the feeling that I had about what God wanted for me nearly always coincided with what I wanted for me. It wasn't often the other way around. Um, and so... Some of you will be different, but for me, I had a certain way of thinking in my mind that once I realized that that was unreliable, I have gathered people in my life who are absolute trusted friends, who if I have decisions to make, or I have a call to make, or I'm struggling with something, rather than rely on my own measure of myself, I will run it by them. And these are people, some of you in here, who don't tell me just what I want to hear, but will actually tell me what I might not want to hear or give me a completely different perspective. And so, because to measure yourself by yourself is arguably quite unwise, is it not? I've learned to live transparent and open, um, accountable to people, um, and to live open to the idea of what's next. Now, again, I used to, have to want to have to have everything buttoned down, but there's a wonderful verse in Romans 8 that says, This resurrection life you receive from God is not a timid, grave-tending life. It's adventurously expecting, gr expectant, greeting God with a childlike, what's next, Papa? How often do you wake up in the morning and think, oh, What's next? I have to say, I, I, that's not really been traditionally. I don't live with that expectation. I almost want everything in its place and everything's safe. And I read that again today and I thought, oh, that sounds brilliant. The idea that you wake up each day and think, right, what's next? What have I not experienced? What have I not seen? What is there to learn? Who is there to meet? What is, what is there today that could be ahead of me? Um, can we live in an expectation of what's next? Would you like to live there? I think it sounds exciting. And I, I found that I was clinging on so tightly for a while um, because I was so afraid of what might be around the corner. And some of you, I know, live in fear of being so frightened of what's around around the corner. It's never a good thing around the corner. My husband will tell you, I do not like surprises. I don't like surprises because I've had surprises that made me sad in the past. So I have an association with surprise, sad. It, 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 the two go together. Never throw me a surprise party. I would hate it. I would hate it. I'm not... I would hate it. Never put me on some television show or do anything like that. But you can buy me gifts or whatever. Um, but I, perhaps if you all did really nice surprises for me, I'd start to associate surprise equals good. There you go. That's your call to action. Um, but I still have moments when I feel like that. But I'd rather become somebody who can take a risk in the adventure of now than have a timid, grave-tending life. I sat with a pension advisor the other day. That's not a fun conversation, sitting with a pension advisor, is it? It was your friend, Mick. No offence, they were lovely, but it wasn't fun. Um, telling you, trying to work out how many years you're going to live for and how much money you're going to need to put away. I'm not going to be able to live if I put that much money away. But um, it's, my dad was with me because 
Again, I don't trust me with this stuff, but my dad knows everything about this stuff. So he was listening in on the conversation, asking those questions that I wouldn't have thought to ask. Um, and um, I had to do this thing where I had to fill in um, how risk averse, you know, risk averse you are, or how, what is it, um, how much you're willing to take a risk and how much you like to play it safe. So it, what was amazing, and I was absolutely thrilled by this, is that I'm thinking I'm not a risk taker. I'm not a risk taker at all. So he's asking me this question, like, um, are you likely to take big risks, yes or no? I went, no, never. And my dad's like, yes, you are. I went, no, I'm not. He went, oh, yes, you are. And he proceeded to list things that apparently I've done in my life that have terrified him. He's like, well, you did this and you did that and you did the other and... Graham quit his job and he went back to study and you had no money to do that and then you didn't go back to work when you had Daniel and then you quit your massive job to go self-employed. I was terrified, Jenny. I couldn't believe you were doing it and I just had to smile and nod. And then all of a sudden you realise everybody has a different um, perspective on risk. What was felt safe to me can feel risky to someone else. But wherever our starting point is, we have got to take a few more risks to live a life of adventure with that expectant, what's next, Papa? Now, I measure my spirituality far more now, as we've been hearing in recent weeks, and I love what we've been hearing, I found it so helpful. I measure it far more now, not on what I experience when I'm um, sitting and um, having my quiet times um, alone, but I measure it far more now on my attitudes and relationships towards how I see myself and towards how I see others. For all the reasons I've been hearing about recently, um, and I measure it like that, not to decide whether I'm scoring enough godly points, because that's really not required, um, but because I'm on a quest, hopefully with you, to pull in the kingdom, as we've been hearing about with that wheel, in all its glory. And I want to do that with some integrity and have an impact. Now, so many, there are so many things that you see in the world that are tough. I mean, that thing in Barcelona and all these things that keep happening, they, they absolutely, I hate them. I, I find them very difficult to watch, very difficult to understand. And I, you, see the, the, you see almost the worst in humanity, but yet you almost also see the best in humanity because the amount of things you see about the human kindness people show. Um, but you can walk down a street on holiday and be attacked. That's not nice. That, that's hard. That makes the world feel unsafe. But what we have been learning is that when you strip everything away and you strip everything you see and you strip everything we can't understand, three things remain. And the three things are faith, hope and love. You take it all away, faith, hope and love is always going to remain and the greatest of those is love. And I want to be an antidote to pain where I can find opportunity to be an antidote to pain um, because my goodness, I have had so much, um, I have had so many things be an antidote to my pain in life. And I want to say that God has healed my pain. In the, and in the overarching sense of he is the source of all love and all healing and all power, God has healed my pain. But in a practical sense, he's healed it through the hands of people. People have been the body. People have been the hands and feet. People have been the words of kindness. People have been the shoulder to cry on. People have been the kick up the bum when I've needed it. People, people have been the hands and feet. So yes, we credit God, but we have to credit the God that has expressed through human beings in all its glory. And in my quest sometimes for a spiritual high and fix for many years, I severely underestimated um, the impact that people were having on my life in the most positive sense of the word. Um, people have been amazing in my life and sometimes I've been busy ignoring the people around me because I'm so busy stressing about how I'm supposed to please this God that I've decided has to be pleased. When all the time, in the midst of that, you got the expression of God in the people around you who were made in his image. That, to me, now makes more sense. Um, people are pretty phenomenal. Pretty f Human beings are an incredible creation. I, um, I still... My sat-nav is named Jan after Jan Condy. <laughs> and the reason... Uh, yes, it is. Because Jan Condy makes me feel safe. 
And she does. And the reason why Jan makes me, and I get lost, so I feel unsafe in the car, so I call my sat-nav Jan. The reason why she makes me feel safe is in 2001, my world crashed. And I, I'm sorry. And I sat in her living room and she was gone to me. She was gone to me. And I will never forget that as long as I live. And then, I will never forget that as long as I live. Because she was gone to me that night. And I will never forget that as long as I live. And I could tell, um, I could tell, it's going well, isn't it? I'm sure that sometimes when I cry, it's it's like, I'm sure sometimes it's to get, God does it to get your attention. Um, Because I don't mean to do it. I mean that in the nicest sense. Because people are the face of God. And there'll be all of you in here. I mean, I've been here for what, 20 How many years have I been here? 24 years. You've been my family. You've been my family. I don't think I would have got through half of what I've got through. The reason why I will um, love and serve and do what I can for Anne and Chris is for the rest of my life. It's because they are incredible people who have helped me save my marriage, my family, have kept me sane. It, it, It matters. Our community and what we've been to each other matters. And you could all, those of you who are guests with us, you'll have your people, but you could all look around this room now and think of people that have been the face and hands of God to you. And that, that now is how we must measure, um, how we must measure, and that, that to me is what Chris and Anthony have been saying for the last few weeks, that is a measure of what it is. Not do we all believe identical things, not can we all trot off the same doctrine, not are we all following the rules, not do we all look like we've got the lifestyle, but are we all the hands and feet and face and heart of God to one another? That is kingdom. That is exciting. That is just beautiful. Now, um, none of that was in my notes. That's fine. What time are we on? I've was um, reminded again about the book, Everybody's Normal Until You Get to Know Them. Um, by a guy called John Oldberg, which is fairly true, isn't it? Um, And he talks about, you know, when you go to a supermarket and there's a reduced items shelf where everything's going quickly, you you know, cheap, and you have to buy it as is. You're not allowed to take it back and say, um, you know, like sales racks in shops. And this is what he says. This is the department of something's gone wrong. You're going to find a flaw here, a stain that won't come out, a zipper that won't zip, a button that won't butt. That's brilliant, isn't it? A button that won't butt. <laughs> That's brilliant. There will be a problem. These items are not normal. We're going to tell you where the floor is. We're not going to tell you where the floor is. You'll have to look for it, but we know it's there. So when you find it, and you will find it, don't come whining and sniveling to us because there's a fundamental rule when dealing with merchandise in this corner of the store. No returns, no refunds, no exchanges. If you're looking for perfection, you walked down the wrong aisle. Um, You have received fair warning. If you want this item, there's only one way to obtain it. You must take it as is. When you deal with human beings, you have come to the as is corner of the universe. Think for a moment about someone in your life. Maybe the person you know best, love most. That person is slightly irregular. Um, That person comes with a little tag. There's a flaw here. Just the one. I think that's a, I think that's kindness. There's only one in each of us, isn't there? Um, a streak of deception, a cruel tongue, a passive spirit. I thought that was interesting. An out of control temper. I'm not going to tell you where it is, but it's there. So when you find it, and you will find it, don't be surprised. If you want to enter relationships, there's only one way, as is. If you're looking for perfection, you have walked down the wrong aisle. You, you've walked down the wrong aisle. If you're looking for a perfect group of people here, you have come to the wrong place. But I challenge you to find it anywhere else. Um, now, there's a great revelation that I had recently, um, and I've told you before that I'm definitely a recovering, nearly recovered perfectionist, is that God saw the world as good. He did not see the world as perfect. He saw the world as good good. And when he he made the world, there was like dust and everything. It wasn't like some finished, pretty, perfect place. There was elements of it that were represented what it could look like. And then there was the rest that just looked barren. And he said, you partner with me and let's make this look like that. But let's do this bit together because I don't I want to work with you I want to partner with you and 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 I genuinely have found it so helpful in my life to aim for good 
Aim to be good. Aim to see good in everybody. Aim to give it your best shot. Aim for good, not for perfect, because some of the time you're going to manage that and you can celebrate it. And it's absolutely brilliant. It's not, it was not the finished perfect article. It was going to change from one year to the next, as your own garden does. It was an invitation to a quest, a beginning that was oozing with possibility. It wasn't static, sterile. It was dynamic. Now, if you're not prepared to accept a good a level of goodness and as is with people as they are now in their journey where they are, you're going to really struggle with pulling in the kingdom as we've been hearing about. Now, I've been in church all my life and I have met some of the best, most amazing people in that circle. Um, but I've also found too often that those in church, we can be far less tolerant of imperfection than those outside because we were given the idea that was this standard we had to reach. A lot of my non-church friends were never given that standard to have to reach. They were told to give it their best shot and they were good enough. They weren't almost didn't have that inbuilt thing of, well, if you don't make it here, if he's not happy with you. We can be far less tolerant and forgiving. And how devastating, because surely we should be the most forgiving, generous, warm, inclusive, friendly, kind people um, in the whole entire world. And I love what we've done and are doing to shift that. That's the seed change that we've had in here. But some of us still struggle because in ourselves, we still have a really high standard that we aspired to for all the right reasons. But some of those reasons are now redundant because there was never, the line was always underneath us. It was always underneath us. We've always lived loved. We've always lived worthy. We've always lived that way. Now, Ortberg, again, in his book, wrote this, um, those who love their dream of a Christian community more than the Christian community itself become destroyers of that community, even though their personal intentions may be ever so honest, earnest, and sacrificial. We can love the idea of our community more than we love the people who make up that community. How easy does, how easily does that happen? Um, and it applies to us as individuals too. I was so earnest and honest, and I always have been. I've, I've made up a new word today, earnesticity. I was very earnest and honest in my earnesticity. Um, I used to, pr- I, I was, I've always endeavoured to be faithful to my understanding at the time. And my understanding at the time was that, you know, y- y- you had to spend hours a day praying. And now we've come to believe you have a prayer life that as you walk out each day, yes, it's good to have some time where you meditate and think because that's helpful, but your life is a prayer. But I, at the time, believed I had to set aside as many hours as possible to pray. And so um, I went through a period where I decided, and for all the right reasons, and actually at the time it helped me, I decided I was going to give four hours of my day to God when I was a student. Bear in mind, I was doing an English Lit degree and I was only in lectures 12 hours a week. I had four hours a day. So it wasn't like I was trying to do that with a job. I decided I was going to do four hours a day. And in that four hours a day, I had lists, I had tapes, I had songs, and I would pray for everyone and their dog. I mean, everyone and their dog. Um, But while I was doing that, I would not have breakfast with the people I shared a house with. Um, I would often, they would be going out to do things and I would not go with them because I was busy praying. Now, can you, can you see where I'm going with this? It, it, it actually caused me to disconnect from some things that would have made me an answer to prayer in people's life because I was busy doing my prayer detached because it was like I wasn't part of the world. Now, I know that makes me sound a little bit odd, but that's where I was at at the time. But because my world was not safe, and because my world was not safe, I was endeavouring to find safe feelings. Um, And I remember the moment where I felt challenged that, do I want to keep living like this, or do I want to become someone who can be the hands, the feet, the face, the the answer to a person's life, the God-made flesh in their world? Um, Did I want to be that more than hidden away in my room, having a great time creating godly feelings but being not really very helpful on a practical basis I hope you hear what I'm getting at Um, now my faith was me withdrawing from the world around me to ask God to do it all not me being available to participate in the restoration of all things as the hands and feet of change 
And I was too frightened to do that. So from that day, I've sought to change and do that. And sometimes I do a really good job. Other days, I pick myself up, dust myself off, and I'm glad for <laughs> brand new mercy. Yay! Um, now, I used to think that every moment had to have this spiritual feeling for it to mean something. That I had to hear God talking to me all the time, telling me, do this, go there, be that, whatever. Um, or else I was somehow out of tune that I was somehow not tuning in to this sort of other experience. I, I, you had to live this sort of outer body experience for it to mean something. And some of you I know know what I mean. I know some of you are here. Some of you are thinking you're a bunch of weirdos. <laughs> but that's, it, it was real. Um, and then what I found was life got turned up by event after event, and they seemed to just keep coming. And that world in my head... I, I couldn't sustain it. Um, and it was like then that the heavens went silent. Now, of course, I look back now and I realise it wasn't that somehow God had stopped speaking. Is I'd done an absolute runner and was no longer, <laughs> I was no longer up for anything. But it was like everything went silent. Um, and so what I did was I got seriously busy. I mean, seriously busy. I left no room to think. I thought if I just fill up all of my time and all of my space and I don't have to think, I don't have to face the fact that my whole head has just gone silent and don't have this somehow cosmic voice telling me exactly what to do all the time. Now, I'm not getting into whether I think it was God or not God. It's not really the point. The point is we find all sorts of solutions in life rather than taking a step back, having a look at what's going on, getting with someone to help us and just letting someone be the hands and feet of God to you to get on this. Now, fortunately, I've had such people in my life who've helped me um, and you come out to a new day, but I would not have got there in a million years without being willing to be known and to be helped and to be seen and having some really messy conversations. You can't do it on your own. You daft to try because you cannot be the own measure of yourself. You're asking way too much of yourself. So please, please, um, let someone help you with your head. I find it's brilliant. And those of you who have, don't have complicated minds, um, help us that do. Please help us that do. My husband's very patient with me, bless him. Um, now, I still have to break some of my old habits fully. I just got back from holiday, and um, at first, you, you, is it just me? When you go on holiday, who needs a few days to unwind? I used to know my dad was relaxed because by day four, he'd take his socks off. Um, that's when I knew we'd arrived, <laughs> we'd arrived on holiday. Um, it's like the socks on. My mum would go, it's fine, his socks are off. Um, it takes me, it took me a few, he had white little lines though. He was on catch up first holiday. Um, first few days when I got on holiday, I kept thinking of the emails I weren't answering because a lot of my work's on email. And some of you know, I don't like my inbox to get too full. Um, I kept thinking of the people I couldn't help because I was away. I kept thinking of people I should text. My head was back in England while my body was in Croatia. Croatia's lovely, who's been? If you've never been, yes, you've been, love. You were with me, darling. <laughs> um, it was good, wasn't it, love? Um, <laughs> you were there. I saw you. Um, <laughs> you are funny. Um, it's beautiful. But, um, and, but and my boy, my boy and my husband, they are so much better than me at being present, at just being like, this is what we're doing now. Nothing else matters. I, on the other hand, <laughs> am on next next month but what I learned on holiday is I thought right we have had a busy year we've had a tough year it's been lots going on this year and I've been so excited about this holiday and then for the first couple of days I wasn't there for it my body was there but I wasn't and I thought right the only thing that is required of me like that video said is what is the task in front of me now I will make my bed really well and then I will go and say good morning to someone warmly while they have their breakfast if I'm fortunate enough to live in a home where I'm loved by other people. And do you see what I mean? You, you find yourself thinking we miss the moments we give our first and best, not to the moment that we're in, but to something that we're not even in. And we were chatting today and, you know, there's only one moment, this moment exists once. It's gone. It's gone. And how often are we living life somewhere else? Um, now, why am I telling you this? Because it's okay to be as you are right now, um, and it's okay to not be perfect, and it's okay to decide that instead of sleepwalking through your life to the next thing you're worried about, you're just going to wake up and you're going to live this moment to the absolute best of your ability, loving the people in your vicinity as well as you can, and that is enough. 
that is enough. Because if everybody does that in any given moment, everybody is the hands and feet and face of God, the world changes. If when I'm on holiday with my husband and son, I'm that busy thinking about someone back home that I'm texting, and I'm not loving the very people that have been given to me, and the, most, the people that are most precious to me, what, what am I saying to them? I'm not being the hands and feet of God. I'm somehow, I know we don't always manage it. We're not perfect. That's the point. But that's surely the goal. That is surely a great goal. I think so. Um, I'm going to skip that bit out. The, the bit I was... The, there's also in this book, it's quite a good book, actually, um, is he talks about how people have this view of the Bible that the characters are like pious, stained-glass characters who don't reflect the real, real world. And then he lists... <laughs> just how messy those characters were. They were just people. They were people with their stories doing their best, and the stories didn't qualify them. The stories didn't disqualify them. They were just people. We are equally characters who are endeavouring to make the world a better place. Um, now, if you just look... Show me slide one, will you, um, Phil? Thank you. Um, has that been up the whole time? Oh, great. Um, I'm going to, even though I've not mentioned this yet, and we're, we're running out of time. It's ironic because I was panicking earlier today. I wanted Joel said, I can't fill the time. I've got nothing to say. Now I'm running over. Um, <laughs> I've called this How to Dance with Prickly People for the bit I'm going to show you um, next. Um, because I want to talk about the other thing that he talks about in this book, which is why I went to the book because I remembered it, is he talks about porcupines. Because part of the issue that we have in how we relate to one another is that because we've, all, we've been hurt, we build up a, um, a mechanism to protect ourselves from pain. And so this idea that we're the hands and feet and face of God means you have to be really willing to invest in people. And I don't think it's just me that finds some people quite scary because we don't feel safe. And there's all sorts of reasons why we don't feel safe and you'll have your things that make you prickly. We've developed over the years things that we think we need to protect ourselves. So at some point in life, something hurt and we thought, I never want to feel that again. And we put in place something that becomes a defense. So something happens over here, you think, right, I don't trust that. I'm going to make sure that never happens again by doing this. And over the holidays, when Graham and I were chatting about some stuff, I realized some things I have put in place in my life to make certain areas of my life feel safe that are utterly irrelevant and impractical, and I just need to let them go. Just let them go, because they're no longer required. Now, he talks about in this book, how do you get close without getting hurt? And he says that that's our dilemma because every one of us carries our own little arsenal. Our barbs have names like rejection, condemnation, resentment, arrogance, selfishness, envy, contempt. And some people hide them better than others, but get close enough and you will find out they're there. Isn't that the truth? They burrow underneath our skin. They can wound and fester and even kill. And we, like the porcupine, learn to survive through a combination. I thought this was brilliant. We learn to survive through a combination of withdrawing and attacking. Now, be honest. Don't we do that? There's some things where we think, I'm just step away. And other things are like, rah! And, and we work out in any given situation which one's the best the best route for securing our safety. Um, and we then find ourselves hurting and being hurt just, as a, just through the course of rubbing up against each other in life. Just because you've got your stuff and I've got my stuff and sometimes the stuff rubs together and you're like, out, out! And then you, run, you do a runner and then you think, I'm not going to go near that person again because that really hurt. And they're thinking, I'm not going to go near you really again because it really hurts. And then that's when you get disconnect. Rather than going, ow! Ow, did that hurt you? Yes, that hurt me. Oh, let's talk about that. Okay, right. Ooh, still loved. We're fine. Ooh. If we could just learn to do that, wouldn't it be brilliant? Have that level of bounce back. Um, so where are you, prickly? Not asking you to answer now. And I'll tell you where you know you're prickly when you feel yourself go. <gasps> when you feel yourself either wanting to withdraw or wanting to attack, ask yourself, oh, what, what's sticking out of me that I've put there as a defence do I need to keep that? I'm not saying we don't have to be wise, but 
just start to use it as your alarm system because the three things that are going to remain are faith, hope, and love. So if that quill that makes you go, doesn't have an expression of faith, hope, and love, you've got to pull it in. You've got to be like, okay, I've got to ditch that one. It might leave me a bit vulnerable, might be a bit scary, but I'm going to take a risk in that relationship because I want the community. I want us to be the hands and feet and face of God. What remains isn't rights, superiority, and justice. I'm right. I know best. This is the action that will right this wrong. That's not what remains. What remains is faith, hope, and love. Okay, I'm going to have... I really have ended up with too much stuff. It's okay. One second. Okay. How long have I got? Oh, I'm all right. I'm all right. Thank you, Pete. I'm just going to whisk through. Um, we develop some spikes for self-protection, but we can find ourselves wishing we didn't have them, can't we? And porcupines may be safe, but they, oh, they are alone. There's not a, root, a word for a collective group of porcupines. You know, it's like a herd of cows. Or what, 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 are, what are ducks? I thought of ducks, and I don't know what the collective word for a group of ducks is. Oh, well. Flock of sheep, that'll do. There isn't a collective word for a group of porcupines because they kind of live on their own. Because they're spiky, they're too spiky. But there is a miracle of miracles in that there is something called the dance of the porcupines. Of course, porcupines would at some point have to connect or there'd be no more porcupines. Is that not true? So in order for them to connect, they have to do a special thing. On rare occasions, one porcupine will share space with another and they become friends they learn to keep their barbs to themselves. Not only that, they figure out how to get together at least long enough to make another generation. <laughs> Brilliant. It's putting it so tapfully. Um, in an image too wonderful to be made up, naturalist David Costello writes, males and females may remain together for some days before mating. They may touch paws and even walk on their hind feet in the so-called dance of the porcupines. Then he says this, only God could have thought up Two porcupines foxtrotting paw to paw when no one but they and he will ever see. That's when I think you know God's got a sense of humour. It turns out there really is an answer to the ancient question, how do porcupines make love? They pull in their quills and learn to dance. Now, if it's possible for the porcupines, might it be possible for us? I think so. Imperfect people like you and me can pursue community with other imperfect people by learning to dance. And you have to start with the actual porcupines right in your life, right now. Excellent. Um, I am not unprotected. I, I was glad we sang that song, as I said, about being safe, because that, that's where I've realised my problem has come. Because I felt unsafe, that's caused me some real issues, because I've put in things that are never going to make me safe. And I used to... One time, um, this will be one of my times when I was um, in my room being with God in my, the way that I did, that shows it was helpful to some things. I memorised Psalm 91, and some of you will have done the same. And it's not a bad idea sometimes to spend time memorising some good stuff that it reminds you. We used to have some confessions that we wrote out here. Um, he who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will rest in the shadow of the Almighty. It says, he is my refuge and strength, not Find a way to make yourself safe and just dig in. He is my refuge and strength, something beyond me. And, and what also struck me, um, just to close, about that video is how together they were in that mud. When they were absolutely up to their necks, I don't think I could have done it. I'd have been on, in the group, not of the 42 that got out. Um, I say that, but maybe I wouldn't. Um, they were up to their necks in it, but they were all in it together. And it, that's what most spoke to me, actually. And then when one of them started singing and the other one joined in, what I long for more than anything is a community where you're absolutely safe in each other's arms, in each other's minds, in each other's thoughts, in each other's conversation, in each other's attitude. Not because we all get on all the time or we all understand each other all the time, but because we are the hands and feet of God to each other. So there's no deal breaker. There's no way we are going to reject the value and worth of that other person because we are in it, sometimes up to our necks in it, but we're in it together. Let me tell you how I think we could measure that as a community we were really flying and how quick we are to forgive for the sake of staying together. 
I mean, incredible. Um, not quitting on each other, whether we're in the same building or elsewhere. We've got members of our church who aren't in this building tonight, and that's absolutely fine. Not how quick we are to explain all the reasons why we're the ones in full possession of the truth, but a 70 times 7 forgiveness. Moses said to Pharaoh, and I, I, this I know is for someone here tonight, maybe for more than one person. Moses said to Pharaoh, let my people go. And some of you are holding people in in our own community captive to your judgments of them. And I'm saying to you now, and I know it, let my people go. Let my people go. We've not got time for it. We've not got the will for it. We've got a bigger task ahead. They are not your enemy because we are one body. Why would we self-harm our own body? If a part of your body was injured or hurting or causing you frustration, you would nurse it. And yet when that something was restrains us about another person, we attack it. It's your body. It's your body. Nurse your own body. Uh, We are a collective. Collective means a cooperative enterprise, a project or undertaking, typically one that is difficult or requires effort. Sometimes it's difficult and requires effort, but lower your quills. Now, I'm going to tell you what the difficult thing is about this, and I'm going to tell you when you're going to hear more about the answer. Um, The problem you've got with all of this loving each other is what Chris was talking about two or three weeks ago. It's really difficult to do if you don't love yourself. And that's another issue for another night. And I know Joel's going to pick up on it in a couple of weeks. Um, But I wanted to end with the idea that the journey to this is in loving yourself. And there was a poem that I used to teach kids in the old GCSE spec before they changed it four more times. Not that I'm bitter. Um, And um, it was called, oh, did you feel, did you see that prickle? Come out there. That's where I'm prickly. Um, Got to address that one. I'm going to... And I want to read this to you because some of you will like poetry, some of you won't. But there's poetry in the Bible and you like the Bible, so this is just a poem. Imagine this in the Bible and it could be in the Bible. Let me read this to you to close because I thought it was brilliant. Um, The time will come when with elation you will greet yourself arriving at your own door in your own mirror and each will smile at the other's welcome and say, sit here, eat. You will love again the stranger who was yourself Give wine, give bread, give back your heart to itself, to the stranger who has loved you all your life, whom you ignored for another, who knows you by heart. Take down the love letters from the bookshelf, the photographs, the desperate notes, peel your own image from the mirror, sit, feast on your life. I'm very happy to do a GCSE style analysis with you afterwards, but the very, the massive message of that is, be kind to yourself. Be welcoming to yourself. Sometimes you may feel a stranger to yourself and not like what you see in the mirror, but give wine, give bread to yourself. Have communion with yourself. Celebrate the things that have got you here and your aspirations and dreams for the future. Do that and you'll have capacity to do it for others and there'll be more to follow on that in a couple of weeks. So can we be generous with ourselves and others? Can we risk it? Can you just pop that final slide on for me, Phil, please? God created prickly people so we would learn how to be magnanimous, um, forgiving and generous. Be forgiving and generous. I'm not sure of the actual theological accuracy of that, but you get the point. A prickly person, and when we're prickly, it's our chance to be generous and to be forgiving. So when you feel a prickle come up in you and a one in someone else... Um, Think forgiveness, generosity. Is that me sparking? Okay. I really genuinely hope this has been helpful. Hope you think about it. Shall we? um... Is that right? Um, Shall we pray? Um, And just, and and said that the wonderful thing Anne said about prayer was you have to think what does my prayer say about God? And if I asked God to help us, I'd be almost saying that he's not already helping us. So instead, I want to ask that we, the Holy Spirit reminds us of things. Do you remember he, he reminds you of things that um, you've heard? So I want to ask more that you would be willing for your life to be a prayer and you would be willing to remember the things I've said to you today such that together we can be the hands and feet of God. So my prayer is more for us 
to encourage us to line up with where he is already working and operating under. So I guess what I'm saying is, as I pray, will you be willing to stand under it and to embrace it? Um, and then we'll all go and be the hands of feet, won't we? Which will be exciting. Okay. Um, I want to thank you so much for everything that you have invested in every human being sat in this place tonight. I want to thank you that there's not been a single time in our individual lives or in our corporate life when we have not been loved, when your investment into us has not been endless, when there has not remained at all times great faith, great hope and great love. And tonight I thank you that there is a strength and there is a generosity of spirit and a forgiveness that is going to flow through this house as the hands and feet of you in this world. And I, I ask Lord that um, where people are struggling, that there will somehow be a remembrance that comes to their mind, something that will, things that will come across their path to prompt them to remember that we are the hands and feet and where they need to let things go, may we let things go. And may we as a community have incredible bounce back with one another, that when we inadvertently wound or even sometimes wound on purpose to protect ourselves that we'd be able to quickly reconcile quickly move on so that we truly be can can be an expression of your face your life your body in this earth and may we avoid self-harm at all costs and be willing to nurse and strengthen each other thank you thanks for watching you can find out more about all the rock is doing locally and internationally at www.rockofyork.co.uk. And why not support the rock from wherever you are? Just hit the donate button now to help us help others.